Boldwood presents The Babysitter Written by Gemma Rogers And read by Imogen Church The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Author's Note this story takes place over three days in October 2020 and is told from the perspective of three of the main characters. Brooke Simmons is 26 years old and desperate to move out of her overbearing mum's home in Red Hill. She works part-time and looks after her friend Ali's daughter Eden twice a week. Brooke met Ali when they used to work together at an online magazine. Jimmy is her ex. Ali Tolfrey is 33 years old and a freelance writer. Married to GP Christopher for almost two years, they have a daughter, Eden, who has just turned one. They reside in a townhouse in affluent Rygate. Brooke is one of Ali's closest friends. Jimmy Pearson is 28 years old and lives on his own in a flat in Red Hill. Currently taking a sabbatical from his work in maintenance at Gatwick Airport, he's a self-proclaimed ladies' man. His father recently passed away and his younger brother moved to Australia four years ago. He is Brooks' ex-partner. Day 1. Thursday, 29th of October, 2020. 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Chapter 1. Brooke Simmons. My head screamed in pain as I forced heavy eyelids apart and tried to focus on the gloomy sky above. Where am I? Terracotta leaves squelched beneath me as I struggled to sit up, one hand reflexively reaching up to the back of my head, trying to staunch the pounding in my skull. A small amount of sticky liquid from my hair transferred to my trembling fingertips. What's that? Bringing my hand back, I recognised blood smeared on my skin. I'm bleeding? The throbbing was so intense it muddled my thoughts as I struggled to get my bearings. Panicked eyes darted everywhere searching for her. Where's Eden? A sensation of dread swelled in my stomach, culminating in an immense scream, its release stuck in my throat. Where is she? I let out a strangled moan as my nails dug into the mud beneath me, trying to cling on to something real as my world turned on its axis. No, no, no. She was gone. There was no buggy, no change bag, no sign of her at all. I blinked rapidly, vision swimming. This isn't happening. A spark of something buried deep in my subconscious niggled at me but I was too confused to make sense of it. Are you hurt? A woman crouched beside me, knees on the sodden grass, staring at the blood on my hands. I shivered, teeth chattering. Damp jeans clung to my skin. Thoughts came in short bursts as I tried to remember what happened, how I came to wake up on the grass. What did I know? It was Thursday. I was at the park, a trip to the swings. Who were we meeting? Oh, God. Where is she? Terror wrapped itself around me as I scanned the park for her. Where's Eden? Airway shrinking, I began to hyperventilate as it became real. Eden was nowhere to be seen. She disappeared. Palpitations ricocheted in my chest and I could hear my pulse in my ears. Thud, 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 faster and faster. Someone had taken her from me. St 
stolen her. The woman crouched down next to me was talking, but I couldn't hear what she was saying. The only sound was a ringing in my ears as spots danced in front of my eyes. Where's Eden? I croaked, throat like sandpaper. Who's Eden? The woman asked as I clambered to my feet, wobbling on shaky legs. I lurched forward and she grabbed me, holding me upright, her handbag falling from her shoulder to the crook of her arm. Her mouth hung open, aghast. Eden! The baby! Where's the baby? I screamed, head spinning. I'm going to ring the police, she said, alarm evident in her voice as I shrugged out of her grip, stumbling onto the path and howling like a woman possessed. Someone had Eden. Snatched her from me. She was only a baby, a defenceless baby. Overwhelming nausea hit me with each movement as I turned left and right, scanning the park, shouting her name. A couple in the distance walking their dog looked over, the noise drawing their attention. I could see a family in the play area, their children on the swings but too far away to make out. Fuck. Where's Eden? I doubled over, fearing I may be sick, sucking in air as I vaguely registered the woman on the phone to the operator, requesting the police and an ambulance. The police? Did I want the police? Something told me it was a bad idea. My head began to clear, the niggling thought from earlier returning. All the while, listening to the lady tell the operator we were at Bushy Park, Rygate. I dropped to my knees, eyes level with a full bag of shopping from Sainsbury's which had been discarded at her feet. Did I have a bag? Only the change bag, and it was gone. Checking the pockets of my jacket, my fingers wrapped around a phone. I pulled it out and unlocked the screen with clumsy fingers, hovering above Ali's mobile number, but unable to find the words. What could I tell her? That I might be responsible for her daughter being abducted? They're on their way. Come and sit down, love. Tell me what happened. The woman encouraged, her voice as soft as silk. I've been attacked, I stammered, as she helped me up and led me to the wooden bench and I sank onto it. She took off her red woolen coat and draped it around my shaking frame. I wanted to protest. Drizzle hung in the air and she was older, around fifty, but she wrapped her arm around me and held it firm. All the time, white-hot pokers were being inserted into the back of my head and I reached up again tentatively to check they weren't really there. Did you have a baby with you? She asked. Yes. She's gone. I whined, unable to stop myself shivering. Good Lord, you, your daughter? The woman's voice was shrill. The sound tormented my ears. Eden? No, no, she's not my daughter. I'm the babysitter. I put my head in my hands and sobbed. The woman's hand caressed my back, soothing strokes, as sirens wailed in the distance. Chapter Two Jimmy Pearson there you go. It's okay. Here's your dummy, I said, keeping my gravelly voice steady as I hurriedly tried to clip the grisly child into the car seat. Fingers fumbling with straps I wasn't used to. We're just going on a little drive. Eden wriggled in protest, trying to break free, flexing her body to prevent being constrained. Come on... I said through gritted teeth, more to myself than to her, the vein in my forehead pulsating. We had to get on the road and fast. Eventually I wrestled her in, the fastness snapping shut, catching the skin of my finger. Fuck! I growled. In defiance, she spat her dummy out and screamed, the noise jarring instantly. 
My eye twitched, blood pressure soaring. Clenching my jaw, I picked the dummy up from her lap and put it back in her mouth before adjusting the seatbelt to make sure she was secure. The toy bar I clipped to each side of the seat grabbed her attention immediately, and the dummy remained in place. Closing the door, I collapsed the buggy as quickly as I could, initially struggling to find the clips. I contemplated leaving it behind, but then it gave and flopped to the ground. I threw it in the boot and hurried around to the driver's side, keeping my head low as I ducked into the seat. I took a second to straighten the Navy Three Lions baseball cap I'd retrieved from the hold all in the rear footwell, pulling it as far down as I could while still being able to see. The engine started straight away, windscreen wipers spring into life, but I was too heavy on the accelerator, tyres flicking mud into the air from the grass verge as the wheels spun. My heart thrashed like it was going to burst out of my chest, and I looked through the rain-speckled windows to see if anyone was around to witness my revving. Luckily, there was only one lady and her dog around 50 metres away, and she seemed absorbed in her mobile phone. The sky was grey and it continued to drizzle. We'd been hit with a week's worth of rain in the past few days, but this morning it had been dry, up until half an hour ago anyway. That's why I'd suggested a trip to the park, some fresh air, knowing Brooke would agree. She thought she'd be getting paid, so it was an added incentive to come. I had the money with me, more than £500 she'd ask for this time, but I had no intention of paying her ever again. I'd left the car right by an underpass using a cut through of woodland to get into Bushy Park to meet Brooke. I'd checked and there were no cameras nearby. The closest house was 50 metres away. It wasn't the obvious route into the park and hadn't been forgiving when attempting to wheel the buggy back the way I'd come, hastily dragging it through pine cones, rotting conkers and twigs. I'd had to carry it most of the way, sweating from the effort of trying to jog with it, desperate to get Eden into the car and out of sight. Blood rushed into my ears as my heart continued to race, sweat pooling at my lower back from the exertion. I was adding to the musty smell of the car, but I didn't dare lower the windows. Instead, I turned on the hot air, hoping to disperse the condensation building up on the windscreen. Outside was cold. The clocks had gone back the week before. Autumn was in full swing and the days had become grey and uninviting. Enough to stop you wanting to get out of bed, although that morning I had a reason. Eden. Despite the adrenaline coursing through my veins like lightning, I had to keep calm, remember to drive slowly, safely. I was carrying precious cargo and didn't want to draw unnecessary attention. We'd made it back to the car quickly and, more importantly, unseen. Everything had gone to plan. I had my beautiful daughter. And now we had to get as far away as possible. I'd left my car at home, opting to use my dad's old Burgundy Mondeo, which was still registered in his name. He bought it new in the late 90s and it only had 50,000 miles on the clock, having spent much of the past few years in his garage. Taxed and MOT'd every year, but not often driven since we'd grown up. As kids, we were in it all the time. I remembered sitting in the back with my brother off to footy training, the new car smell making us feel sick as Dad tortured us with capital gold on the radio. Driving it felt alien in comparison to my Audi, and I shifted in my seat, trying to get comfortable. Glancing in the rearview mirror, I could see plump, rosy cheeks working away on the dummy as Eden spun the plastic dolphins on the toy bar in front of her, chestnut brown eyes still watery with tears. Hopefully she would go to sleep soon. It was dark in the back as both rear side windows had black fabric sunscreen stretched over them. 
but they were a spontaneous purchase yesterday while I shopped for baby clothes on sale at the till. I fitted them before I left this morning, figuring with them attached to the windows at the back either side, no one would be able to see in if they pulled alongside us. I'd take the risk of someone thinking it was strange being late October and summer a distant memory. Behind me, a spinning mirror rattled as it rotated, causing Eden to kick her legs excitedly. It was distracting, and I scratched my stubble, skin catching on a torn nail. I'd find it easier to concentrate on the road if I pretended she wasn't there. As I followed signs for the M25, I tallied everything I'd packed. Food, formula, nappies, wipes and clothes, hoping I hadn't forgotten anything. My eyes darted to the mirror again, careful to keep them returning to the road every few seconds. Eden's eyelids were already heavy, the motion of the car lulling her to sleep. I put the radio on low for background noise. Another hour and we'd reach the M1. One more hour, and we disappear for good. Chapter 3. Brooke Simmons The police arrived within minutes of the phone call, blue lights still flashing outside the park gate as two officers in reflective jackets hurried towards us on foot. Helen, the good Samaritan who'd introduced herself as we'd waited, flagged them down. She'd tried to keep me talking, to calm my hysteria as the relentless drizzle turned into fat droplets of rain, but nothing could ease my racing thoughts. Part of the bench was sheltered by an oak tree and she'd shuffled me down to try and keep dry. I couldn't stop shaking, my body moving of its own accord brain pulsing like it was about to burst out of my skull. The sharp stabbing pains made me nauseous and I struggled to concentrate. I just wanted Eden back. Where was she? I knew I needed to call Ali, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. How could I tell her? Her worst fear, every mother's worst fear had come true. Her beautiful daughter had been taken and I had no idea where she was. How could I look her in the eye when it had happened whilst she was in my care? Not when I thought I knew who'd done it. As the officers approached, I handed Helen back her coat and lurched towards them, the tarmac slapping beneath my trainers. I came up short, the swift movement sent me reeling and I doubled over. Help! Please! They've taken my friend's daughter! I yelled as they came closer. One of the officers immediately radioed for reinforcements, rushing forwards to assist, worried I might topple. The other, tall and gangly, came to a stop in front of me, a notebook already in his hand and underneath today's date, noted the time as 25 past 11 and our location, Bushy Park, Rygate. I'm PC Barrow and this is PC Kempton. The paramedics are on their way. What's your name? he asked. Brooke Simmons, I replied shakily, standing to full height. I shouldn't have moved so quickly, my vision blurred. PC Kempton took a step forward, watching me closely, ready to catch me if I fell. Brooke, I understand you've been attacked, PC Barrow asked. Yes, I was hit around the back of the head, but it stopped bleeding now. I was getting impatient. I'd be okay, but they needed to search for Eden. And you say a child's been taken? What's the name of the child? He continued, his pen poised. Eden Tolfrey. I babysit her. I tucked my unruly hair behind my ears to stop it flapping in the wind. How old is Eden? I shuddered at the question. Helen appeared at my side, her arm around my middle as my knees weakened. She's just a year old. Tears streamed from my eyes. 
She was so small, so little. What had I done? Can you tell me what she looks like, what she is wearing? Um, she's b blonde, short hair, brown eyes, wearing grey leggings, a pink striped top, cardigan and coat. The buggy has gone too. It's a yellow bugaboo and there was also a change bag on the back. PC Kempton soaked it up, happy to let Barrow do the talking. He was a stocky Asian man, much shorter than Barrow. The pair couldn't have been more opposite. He scanned the park as I had before speaking into his receiver again, reiterating Eden's name, age and description. So what happened this morning? What time did you arrive at the park? P.C. Barrow asked, his tone matter-of-fact. I got here about 10.30, taking Eden to the swings. I sniffed, wiping my tears away. Did you see who attacked you? He jumped in, stare expectant. I shook my head, wishing I hadn't as the park spun. It was the truth. I hadn't seen who'd attacked me. I told him we were heading back because of the rain just before 11 when I was hit around the back of the head. The next thing I knew, I'd woken up on the grass and Eden was gone. I wrung my hands as I spoke. The words didn't feel real. Like I was reciting something I'd seen on television, not what had just happened to me. It made my stomach churn. Can you tell me where Eden lives and her parents' details. P.C. Barrow's manner was authoritative, like that of a teacher scolding a schoolgirl. It put me on edge. I gave the address, retrieving my phone so I could supply Ali's mobile number too. P.C. Kempton radioed it in. Where exactly did the attack happen? P.C. Barrow asked, creases etched into his forehead. Oh. Go get some tape, P.C. Kempton chipped in instinctively before jogging back to the car. Over here, I said, leaving Helen on the path and leading the officer towards the flattened grass where I came to. I must have only been out for a few minutes. I shuddered, spotting tiny specks of my blood on the path. OK, we'll tape this off now. P.C. Kempton returned a minute later with bright yellow tape and quickly secured an area of around ten metres, wrapping it around two trees, a lamppost and bin. The tape billowed in the wind, marking the location of the crime. It was something I'd seen on television, advertising a grisly scene on a police drama, but never in real life. It was surreal. November Papa to Whiskey Mike 48 paramedics now on scene, waiting at entrance to the park opposite the church. Over. The radio on his chest blurted, making me jump. PC Kempton spoke into the radio, acknowledging the message received. Are you okay to walk? Barrow asked. I nodded and let him take my upper arm to lead me out of the park. The paramedics are out here. We need to get you seen to. You've got to find her. She'll be frightened, I pleaded, eyes filling again. We've put an alert out. All available officers in the area will be searching. In the meantime, let's get the paramedics to take a look at your injury. He arched back slightly, grimacing at the back of my head as we walked. P.C. Kempton was a few feet behind in step with Helen, who was telling him how she found me unconscious on the grass. He wrote everything in an identical notebook and I heard him take her contact details. What about Ali? She'll be frantic when I don't return with Eden, I worried. We'll visit Mr and Mrs Tolfrey shortly, P.C. Barrow said, his voice strangely soothing. I felt crushed when I thought about how much pain she'd be in how frantic she'd be when the police arrived at her door. Cowardly, I was relieved I wouldn't have to tell her what I'd done. She knew me so well. She'd see I knew more than I was telling. 
with legs like jelly, I let PC Barrow pull me along. It was like an out-of-body experience as my eyes drifted in and out of focus. But I wasn't sure if it was due to shock or the whack around the head. We neared the gates, the park now empty. The rain grew steadily heavier, and I was soaked through, shivering in my bomber jacket, jeans saturated. A bright yellow ambulance was parked at the entrance, and another police car arrived as we exited. PC Kempton thanked Helen and left her at the exit of the park, heading for the patrol car, and PC Barrow led me towards the rear of the ambulance, doors already wide open. He helped me climb inside and physically handed me over to the petite blonde paramedic. She manoeuvred me onto the bed, lifting my legs as I pivoted. All my strength had evaporated. Thoughts melted away, and I tried to listen to the officer explain to the paramedic what had happened to me. A foil blanket first. Then a red woolen one was draped over me and something clipped to my finger. I started to drift, succumbing to the rhythmic throbbing in my head, lulling me to sleep, exhausted from the trauma. Brooke, stay with us, OK? I know you're cold. We're going to try and raise your temperature. I'm going to look at your head, but I'll try not to touch it too much. My teeth chattered loudly as she parted my hair, fingertips gently probing. It stopped bleeding, but I think we're going to have to take you to hospital to get you properly checked out. It may need a couple of stitches. The paramedic tapped my shoulder comfortingly. She had a friendly bedside manner and I found it calming. She's going to need her wound looked at, may well have a concussion. We'll take her to East Surrey. I heard her say in a quieter voice to the officer. OK, do you mind if my colleague PC Kempton rides with you? We'll need to get as much information from her as possible. The paramedic nodded and Barrow smiled before turning to me. My eyes glazed over and I struggled to keep them open. Brooke, can you hear me? PC Kempton is going to stay with you. I'm going to head over to the toll freeze he said, slipping out of the ambulance. PC Kempton replaced him a second later, sitting down opposite me. Did you see a car or where Eden was taken? He spoke in a voice most people reserved for the elderly, softer than PC Barrow. I gave the slightest shake of the head and wished I hadn't straight away. I'm going to be sick. I said, already aware of the bile rushing up from my stomach. The paramedic whisked a cardboard bowl out and put it in front of me as I sat forward and heaved. Splashes of vomit landed on the blanket. Once finished, she handed me a tissue to wipe my mouth. Let me take that, sweetheart, she said, removing the bowl. I sank back with a groan, resting my head on the cool bed and listening to rain patter on the roof. Do you know of anyone who would want to take Eden to harm her or the toll freeze? PC Kempton asked, his dark brows knitted together as he leaned towards me. No, I replied, swallowing hard. The lie stuck in my throat, refusing to go down. Chapter 4. Ali Tolfrey I just finished composing an email to my accountant, a Spotify playlist on in the background, when the doorbell rang. I assumed it was my friend Brooke returning with Eden. I'd heard the drumming of rain on the skylight in the office moments before. I'd said it was a bit damp for a trip to the swings, but Brooke had convinced me fresh air would be good for Eden. Babies needed fresh air, and Eden was only a year old. The weather had been utterly awful all week, and we hadn't been able to get out at all the past few days, other than a coffee at the local garden centre with the NCT girls. 
They had a soft play corner for babies and I made sure we met up regularly. Socialisation with other children was vital for an only child and I wanted to make sure Eden developed properly. I'd read it promoted confidence and prevented separation anxiety, which I hoped wouldn't be an issue when I upped my working hours. Returning to work as a freelance writer, I'd had to push to get my foot in the door with the features editor at Your Beauty magazine, with an in-depth article on a new foundation. The foundation had gained popularity because of its ability to perfectly match customers' skin tones from an online quiz. I'd seen it on Instagram, recommended by a 20-something influencer, and given it a go myself. It wasn't bad, and pretty impressive that you didn't even have to leave your house to get a match. I loved buying makeup, unable to resist a new product to the market, and wrote a lot of articles about new trends, looks, and must-haves. Since Eden had been born last September, I'd been a bit lax in producing features, preferring to concentrate on her but now I was in a place where I could juggle both and was keen to get back to working more hours. I missed being creative, the flow of words and the buzz of getting a feature just right, knowing I'd hit the mark. Getting commissions from editors was the best thing, and it gave me something other than Eden to focus on. I'd never intended to be a full-time mother, although with Christopher's salary I didn't need to work. However, it was nice to earn my own money and feel independent, not the little wife at home receiving a weekly allowance. I'd finished the foundation article that morning and was waiting for feedback, so I moved on to research moisturisers in preparation for a winter skin feature, taking advantage of the time I had whilst Eden was out. I'd met Brooke around four years ago when we both worked for a small online lifestyle magazine. She was a junior accounts assistant and her exuberant personality drew me in. We'd chat over coffee and eat lunch together when I had the time. She was as sharp as a tack and never failed to make me laugh. We'd clicked. She brought me out of myself a tiny little firecracker with wild mahogany hair, always with black eyeliner framing her steely eyes. Two years later, the magazine folded and all of us were made redundant. We were gutted, but Brooke and I still met regularly and our friendship blossomed outside of work. When her fiancé, Carl, cheated on her, she was inconsolable and had to move back in with her mum. I would invite her round for girly chats involving bottles of Prosecco with dinner thrown in to try and lift her spirits. I barely noticed the seven-year age difference between us. Christopher teased me that Brooke was my pet project, but I genuinely worried about her. One day I'd had enough of her moping about Carl's infidelity and her lack of career and sat her down to talk about the future. I convinced her to enrol in a bookkeeping course at the local college to continue along the accounting path, telling her she could open her own business once she was fully qualified. Then she could quit the night shifts at Tesco she'd taken on to tide her over. I told her I'd happily be her first client and had plenty of freelance contacts who'd be glad to hand their tax returns over to someone else. With a little convincing, she enrolled and was now in her second year of the part-time course, beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel. Brooke was thrilled when I accidentally became pregnant with Eden shortly before Christopher and I were due to tie the knot. We'd had a long engagement, having been together for eight years, but a wedding had been put off until Christopher completed his foundation and became a qualified GP. It was a small registry office affair. Neither of us wanted any fuss. It was more a natural progression. We'd already bought the townhouse and were living together. It seemed like the obvious next step. The surprise pregnancy was the icing on the cake. However, it was a tough time for Brooke. She'd started going on a few dates, although she was still bitter about Carl. 
I knew she'd wanted them to settle down and have a baby, but that had been snatched away from her. She worried she was being left behind. Brooke was a lifesaver during the early months when Christopher went back to work. I was frazzled, and she took Eden off my hands for a couple of hours here and there, initially so I could get some sleep. It was wonderful to have her for support, and it brought us closer still. My mother wasn't the most maternal and never offered to help, even when I dropped some hints. I wasn't surprised. I'd been raised by the nanny, and Mary Poppins? She was not. Growing up, my father worked abroad and only came home a few times a year. It was no surprise their marriage had imploded by the time I was a teenager. As the months went by, the routine became fixed. Every Tuesday and Thursday mornings, Brooke came around to spend time with Eden, allowing me to get some work done. Later on, I'd make us lunch and we'd catch up with a gossip in the afternoon when Eden would nap. The arrangement seemed to suit everyone, and I made sure to pay Brooke for the hours she was here, knowing she was desperately saving to get her own place. She refused at first. We were friends and she loved Eden, but eventually she gave in. Brooke was always squirrelling money away. She was careful with what she spent, knowing every penny put aside meant she'd be out of her overbearing mum's house quicker. At 26, she hated living at home again and desperately missed having her own place. A few shifts a week at Tesco whilst studying meant the saving was slow going. It was another reason I wanted to pay her for her time. I knew no one else would look after my daughter as well, and I trusted her implicitly. However, I was apprehensive about Brooke taking Eden out in the damp air this morning. She'd had a bit of a runny nose, which I didn't want to develop into a full-blown cold. Last time, she wouldn't sleep, and no amount of cuddling or cowpaw would appease her. She'd been a monster for a few days, refusing to eat and I was beside myself with worry. I'd ordered all sorts of natural remedies and a humidifier for her room. Of course, Christopher thought I was overreacting and assured me she was fine. As he was a GP, I could hardly argue. He checked her over thoroughly, told me it was a combination of a cold on top of teething, and it would pass. Typically, the next morning, she'd been right as rain and back to her usual smiley self. I could tell Christopher was trying not to gloat when my homeopathic order arrived and was no longer needed, but I told him next time she had a cold, I'd be well prepared. He championed fresh air and plenty of fluids, which was why I relented and let Brooke take Eden to the park, despite it being damp. Positive it was them coming home, I left the Mac and headed downstairs to answer the door. Surprised to find no one outside, just a small parcel left on the doorstep. An Amazon delivery for Christopher. We had one almost every day. He needed to add impulse buying to his CV. I dreaded to think of the credit card bill, probably why I never saw it. Sighing, I picked up the package and looked across the street at the row of townhouses mirroring our own. No one was around. It was that lull between morning rush hour and lunchtime where most people were working, which was what I was supposed to be doing. The doorbell rang a second time as I'd returned to the Mac to refresh my inbox. I'd submitted the edited Foundation article around an hour ago and was eagerly awaiting a response, disappointed it hadn't materialised yet. With a sigh, I pushed myself out of the leather chair and came back down the stairs, this time seeing a blurry figure through the patterned glass. Oh, hello, I said with surprise as I pulled open the front door, expecting to see a soggy brook on the step. Instead, in her place stood a wiry police officer, his pale face wearing a grave expression. Another officer stood slightly behind him, blocked from view. The hair on the back of my neck stood to attention, 
and I fingered my diamond earring, a habit when apprehensive. Mrs. Allison Tolfrey? he inquired. Yes, I said, my voice an octave higher than usual. My name is P.C. Barrow, he said, as he held up his warrant card photo on display. My bottom lip quivered, but I couldn't make myself speak, mind whirring with endless, horrific possibilities at why the police were at my door. Where was Eden? Had Christopher been in an accident? What had happened? May we come in? he said, unperturbed by my mute state. I glanced over his shoulder to see if any curtains were twitching, grateful that our street was still quiet, before moving aside quickly. He stepped past me into the hallway, his baby-faced colleague following. Heart already sinking, I closed the door. Whatever they were here for, it wasn't good. Chapter 5. Jimmy Pearson I pulled into Toddington Services as Eden stirred, her eyes blinking rapidly as if trying to work out where she was. We'd made good time. In just over an hour, we'd already reached the M1. All the way, I kept expecting to hear the wail of sirens behind me, a stream of police cars with flashing lights signalling for me to pull over. My knuckles were white on the wheel, and although I told myself to relax, fear wrapped itself around me, settling on my skin in a blanket of perspiration. On the journey, I'd passed a couple of police cars cruising the M25, but I told myself no one would be looking for the car. I doubted they were even looking for me yet. It depended on how long it took for Brooke to raise the alarm. At the least, we'd had a good head start. Lunchtime was fast approaching, and although my stomach was too knotted to consider eating, I knew Eden would be getting hungry. She always ate at midday on the dot, and woe betide you if you weren't on time. She'd ball her hands into fists and scream at the top of her lungs until she was fed. Parking in the furthest corner from the entrance to the services, I rummaged in the change bag, but the only food it contained were puffed carrot crisps. Brooke had been intending to take Eden home for lunch and had only brought snacks to the park with her. I had food in the hold all, but no way to heat it. No matter, it would have to do. I wanted to avoid going into the services if I could, knowing there would be cameras everywhere. The first jar I pulled out was rice pudding. I found a spoon and got out of the car, moving around to the back so I could climb in next to Eden, shutting the door behind me. She was rubbing her eyes, awarding me with a toothy grin, her arms outstretched, assuming she was about to be let out of her car seat. Instead, I opened the jar and I spooned some into her mouth as she flexed her fingers excitedly. I made the aeroplane noises she was used to and she gobbled it up. She was a good girl for her daddy, never a problem when I fed her. It wasn't the best parenting, pudding, for lunch, but I just needed to get her fed and changed so we could be on our way again. We had another hour and a half drive ahead of us and I didn't want to have to stop again. Eden managed half a jar and almost an entire pack of the carrot crisps, which turned her hands and face an illuminous orange. She fed herself, squishing the carrot into mush, oozing it through her fingers while I checked the news app on my phone. I'd bought a new handset and pay-as-you-go SIM card for the trip, having left my contracted smartphone in the glove box of my car at home. The news didn't bring up anything of interest. There were no reports of a missing child, not yet, anyway, but I knew it wouldn't be long. I didn't have to worry about my disappearance. No one would miss me, only my best mate Dave, but I'd message him every now and again. My boss at Gatwick Airport had agreed to a six-month sabbatical, knowing my dad had recently passed away, and I had a lot to sort out. Eric, my younger brother, had emigrated to Australia when he was 21 
her mum had died when we were both teenagers. I had no family left in the country now Dad had gone, other than Eden. It had hit me hard when I lost Dad. We were close, and his deterioration after a diagnosis of stage 4 pancreatic cancer was rapid. He'd lived for only another six months, and three of those were spent in a hospice. I was still grieving, but trying to keep it together... I had to. I was a father myself now. Dad had been a property developer. The flat in Red Hill he'd signed over to me in my early 20s to get on the ladder. Back then, he bought houses, often at auction, refurbished them and sold them on, making a profit each time. He'd cashed in on the property market boom in early 2000. Eric and I never paid much attention and it wasn't until his will was read that we realised he owned property all over the country. Most had tenants and were being managed by letting agents. That's where his income came from. Eric returned to Australia soon after the funeral where his girlfriend and job were waiting, leaving me the task of consolidating the properties, giving notice to those renting and putting them on the market. It was partly why I'd asked for the sabbatical there was so much to do and I wouldn't need the money from my airport job. The sale of Dad's bungalow a few miles away had been pushed through quickly to a cash buyer when he was alive to pay for his stay in hospice. Even with inheritance tax, the hospice bill of £15,000 and half the remainder wired to Eric, I had plenty to keep me going. My job didn't seem so important anymore. With Dad gone, I realised how precious time was. Time I could be spending with Eden. Looking around at the other cars in the services, people were coming and going, moving about their business, seemingly uninterested in us. Although I held my breath when a police patrol car drove around doing a circuit, instinctively I lowered my head, realising afterwards they wouldn't have been able to see me with the shades on the windows. They appeared not to pay any attention to the car, but after they'd gone, I quickly wiped Eden down and laid her on the back seat to change her nappy. It wouldn't be good to stay any longer than necessary. I'll be quick, I promise, I said as she struggled, handing her a teething ring which she launched into the front seat. I held out my keys, which she snatched out of my hand. Undressing her, aware the door was open and it was cold, I put on a clean nappy as quickly as I could and pulled out the new mustard dungarees and grey long sleeve t shirt from the holdall, ripping the tags off with my teeth. When I sat back, strapping her in again while she was distracted chewing my car key, I marvelled how the change of clothes made her look instantly like a boy. Eden's hair was blonde, short and wispy. Brooke said she'd been practically bald for the first six months of her life. She had big brown eyes and long eyelashes, but there were no distinguishable girlish features. If anyone saw us, we'd be father and son, out for the day. I checked the time wanting to get back on the road and put more miles between us and Brooke. Guilt scratched at my skin, knowing how distraught she'd be. But she gave me little choice. I wasn't about to lose the best thing I'd ever had. Eden babbled in her seat, trying to find the dummy at the end of the chain wedged by her thigh. Right, honey, we're all set and ready to go again. And we've got a brand new name for you, sweetheart. Daddy's going to call you Eddie. Chapter 6 Ali Tolfrey What's this about? I asked, taking them through the hallway into the kitchen, my tone a little brusque, trying to mask the fear engulfing all my senses. Mrs. Tolfrey, can you tell me where I can find Mr. Tolfrey? Is he at work? Yes, he's a doctor at Hillcrest Surgery. He'll be with patients. 
P.C. Barrow nodded towards his colleague, who looked like he was barely out of school. Without a word, he cocked his head and spoke into his radio positioned on his chest. Zulu Mike 2742 November Papa, over. November Papa to Zulu Mike 274, go ahead, over. November Papa from 274, this is urgent. Mr. Tolfrey is a GP at Hillcrest Surgery. Please can we arrange to have him collected and brought back to 64 Beacon Rise ASAP. Over. November Papa received, dispatching now, over. Then the immediate response. All the tiny hairs on my arms bristled. I'm sorry, but can you please tell me what's going on? My voice had become shrill and I folded my arms across my chest. Mrs. Tolfrey, please take a seat. I remained standing belligerently. But sensing I wasn't going to be graced with any further information until I'd followed his instructions, I pulled out a stool from under the breakfast bar. I'm afraid there's been an incident this morning. We received a call to say a woman had been attacked in the park and a child in her care has been taken. He pressed his lips together, exaggerating his sharp cheekbones. God. Brooke, is she okay? I spluttered, gasping as the words slotted into place, my brain slow to make sense of the relevance. Hang on. Taken. What do you mean, take? Abducted. Eden. Someone has got Eden. I could hear myself getting hysterical as the questions exploded out of my mouth like rapid fire. I'm. Afraid it would appear she's been abducted. Yes, although we're still gathering information. We have Miss Simmons en route to the hospital. She has suffered a head trauma but is reported to be stable. The colour drained from my face and I shrieked, Oh God, not Eden! No! I jumped up, a sob bursting from my chest as I caught sight of a photo of Eden attached to the fridge. No! No, you have it wrong. Eden is with Brooke. I'm sure she's fine. I'll call her. I cried, looking around for my phone. Mrs. Tolfrey, I'm so very sorry to be the bearer of such news. A car is being sent to collect your husband. Now he'll be driven straight here. P.C. Barrow put a hand on my arm, trying to calm my hysteria, but I shrugged him off. It can't be her. It can't be. I whimpered, still pacing as tears streamed down my face. I felt sick to the stomach, fear consuming every part of my body. It wasn't real. It was a nightmare. Someone would wake me up, tell me it wasn't true. A detective will be assigned to your case. They will be here shortly along with a family liaison officer. P.C. Barrow's eyes were small and deep-set. I searched them for the answers to the horror I'd been plunged into, it came up empty-handed. I understand this is a massive shock, Mrs. Tolfrey. Time is of the essence, and I have a few questions I must ask. Firstly, do you know of anybody who would want to take Eden? Anyone that would want to harm you or your family in any way? I shook my head, eyes glazed. I can't imagine anyone who would do this. Oh, God, Eden, I sobbed, sinking back onto the stool. Eden is your only child, yes? I have here that she's one year old. Her date of birth is 30th of September 2019, is that correct? Yes, I managed. Miss Simmons is your babysitter? She's a family friend who looks after Eden for me, PC Barrow nodded. I'm sorry to ask you this, but under the circumstances, I hope you understand. How's your marriage, Mrs. Tolfrey? Any issues there? Is this a happy home? Of course it is. I snapped my head up, dark cocoa hair whipping my face. The officer pursed his lips, cheeks ruddy. I glanced at the clock on the oven. It was almost half past twelve. 
I hadn't realised it was so late Eden would be hungry. Terror clawed at my skin, but I couldn't let myself think of the reasons it was happening to us. Had she been stolen to order? The scenarios filling my head were unbearable. The images tortured me. How was this happening to us? I had to ring Brooke. No, Christopher first. Where was my phone? I hadn't even noticed that PC Barrow had moved, but the kettle was on, and the box of tissues usually on the island were in front of me. I plucked one out, wiping my eyes, black mascara coming off in smudges. For once, I didn't care how I looked. Where did this happen? I asked. At Bushy Park. We believe the abduction was at around 11 this morning. That's over an hour ago, I cried, my frustration building. I knew she shouldn't have gone out this morning. It was too damp for a trip to the swings. I should have kept her home, kept her safe. The alarm was raised at around quarter past 11. It appears that Miss Simmons was knocked unconscious for a short time. I shuddered. So Eden could still be at the park. We have to go and look for her. I jumped up. Mrs. Tolfrey, I assure you, the park has been cordoned off and a thorough search is taking place as we speak. PC Barrow placed a cup of steaming hot tea on the breakfast bar. The sugary smell made me queasy. I sucked in air like a fish out of water waiting for the nausea to pass. I knew I should be worried about Brooke. She'd been the victim of a horrendous attack, but instead, animalistic rage consumed me. How could she let my child be taken from her? You have to bring her home to me, I wailed through a haze of tears. The doorbell chimed and I rushed towards it, blocked by Barrow holding out his hand to ward me off. I'll go, he said calmly. I gritted my teeth. This was my bloody house, damn it. I had no control, was helpless, and I wanted to scream into the abyss. My child, my beautiful baby girl, was gone. Muffled voices flowed from the hallway and PC Barrow returned, flanked by a man and a woman, both wearing navy blue suits. Hello, Mrs. Tolfrey. I'm Detective Chief Inspector Marianne Green. And this is Detective Constable Adam Benson. He'll be your family liaison officer for the duration. I wiped my eyes and shook hands weakly with them both, turning away as I heard the front door open once more, and Christopher entered. He looked panic-stricken, his face ghostly in contrast to his copper hair. Ignoring the police, I raced into his arms and wept. He stroked my head, the tremble in his hand obvious. It'll be okay, he whispered his voice as shaky as his hands. My hair caught in the prickle of emerging stubble as he lifted his head to look at the strangers in our kitchen. We'll head over to the park, Mum, PC Barrow said to DCI Green as he loitered in the doorway, head almost brushing the top of the frame, his colleague already at the door. Yes, please do. The site's been cordoned off, Soko are on scene, and there's a fingertip search of the area going ahead imminently. If you can coordinate and update the DC who'll be with you shortly, we need to get going on house to house. PC Barrow nodded and left the four of us alone. The atmosphere was electric, a current pulsating around the room. I didn't dare breathe. DCI Green turned to address Christopher and I, still clinging to each other for support. I'm sorry about that, she said as the front door closed, brushing a lifeless fringe out of her eyes. As I was saying, my name is DCI Marianne Green, and I'm the senior investigating officer appointed to find your daughter. I want you to know, finding Eden has my full attention. The safety of your daughter is my priority, but I will need your help. 
DCI Green looked at each of us in turn, the weight of her words hanging heavy in the air. Whatever you need, Christopher said, pulling himself up to full height, shoulders rolled back. He gestured towards the kitchen, and she followed us in. I understand you've already been asked some questions, some of which we'll need to go over again. Please bear with us. We need to gather all the facts as quickly as possible. Can you please supply me with some recent photos of Eden? Also, I'll need her hairbrush or toothbrush to take with me. She pulled a clear bag from her pocket and laid it on the breakfast bar. I moved away from Christopher to pull the photo from the fridge. It had only been up a few days, taken at the park on the last warm day before autumn truly hit. We'd been feeding the ducks on a Sunday morning. I had many more recent ones on my phone, but I hadn't got around to printing them out yet. Fear lodging in my throat, I ran upstairs to fetch Eden's hairbrush from the nursery. I knew what it was for. DNA to identify our little girl, if necessary. A thought I wouldn't entertain. She didn't have a lot of hair. It had only started to grow in the last six months. Blonde strands remained in the soft bristles and I stroked them, feeling a visceral tugging in my chest as I returned downstairs. What's your relationship to Brooke? DCI Green asked as I entered the kitchen. She's our babysitter, Christopher jumped in, and friend, I added. DCI Green nodded, noting the information down. Can you give me an account of your morning, please, from the moment you both woke up? DCI Green asked. I gave her my full attention as she pulled out a stool and sat, notebook open in front of her. She must have been in her early fifties, no makeup adorned her face, no effort made to hide the lines around her eyes. Light brown hair hung limply, tucked behind her ears. She looked tired, and it briefly crossed my mind whether she was up to the job of bringing my daughter home to me. Chapter 7 Jimmy Pearson my head pounded, a stress headache from running on high alert all morning. The culmination of the plan that had been rolling around my mind for a week. Adrenaline pumped through my system, heightening every sense, every thought, but what went up always came down. Now my body was running on empty. I needed caffeine. Should have bloody brought that energy drink from the fridge this morning, but I was too worried about packing the baby stuff. There were snacks in the hold all, but it was in the back and I couldn't reach the bag whilst I was driving. I opened the window, the rush of air taking me back to the park, the swoosh of the cosh in my ears. I hadn't meant to hit Brooke hard, only enough to daze her. The run-up from behind must have magnified my swing. She had no idea it was me. She thought I'd gone in the other direction when we'd said goodbye at the swings. One tiny whack with the cosh and she was sparked out on the ground. Luckily, she'd staggered to the left of the path, hitting the deck underneath the tree. I didn't have to move her. Once I knew she wasn't getting up, I'd grabbed the buggy and made a dash for it before anyone came along. I didn't hang about. My heart was hammering so hard it was all I could hear in my ears. The kosh had been gathering dust by my bedside and seemed like a good idea to bring at the time. I'd had it for years, mainly for when Dave and I...